Okay, today we come to Jeremiah chapter 39, our 21st study in the book of Jeremiah. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. It was only a matter of time before Jerusalem would fall into Babylonian hands and be conquered. It was doomed from the second God pronounced judgment on it because of its sin. Verse 2, in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, the city was penetrated. Jerusalem had been a rock-solid very strong city. No one ever dreamed it could be conquered, but God was against it because of its sin, and God made it vulnerable as punishment. Verse 3, Then all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. And it says, Nergazaser, Samgar Nebo, Sar Chikam, Rabsaras, Nerjo Sarezer, Rab Mag, and the rest of the princes of the king of Babylon. The Babylonian leaders enter into the city of Jerusalem, but they don't yet disperse their troops. This is very wise. They are about to engage in urban warfare, so they have to be cautious after they enter the city. For so it was when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them, that they fled and went out of the city by night, by way of the king's garden, by the gate between the two walls, and he went out by way of the plain. So when the king of Israel, Zedekiah, heard that Babylon had entered the capital city, he took off running. He didn't have the covering of God, so he took off under the covering of darkness. A poor substitute, by the way. Verse 5, But the Chaldean army pursued them, and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had captured him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah, in the land of Hamath, where he pronounced judgment on him. Judgment was passed on the king of Israel. He was not sentenced to death. Death would have been easier on him. Death would have been preferred to what he's going through. Watch verse 6. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. The king of Babylon also killed all the nobles of Judah. So Zedekiah the king was probably in his early 30s. So his sons must have been just children, possibly some of them even infants. And he is forced to watch as they are killed. And I would say that he is forced to remember that their slaughter is all his fault too. He could have saved them if he had only repented earlier, if he had only listened to the word of God spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. This could have been avoided. 7. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon. His children are murdered, and then his eyes are cut out. He is left in darkness, but not before the slaughter of his children is engraved on his mind forever. Possibly the murder of his children. Possibly that was the last thing that this man ever saw with his eyes. Verse 8. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire, and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. The city is destroyed, and none of this had to be. Verse 9, Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive to Babylon the remnant of the people who remained in the city, and those who defected to him with the rest of the people who remained. After watching their city burn, the survivors, the citizens of Jerusalem, the survivors among Israel, they are taken to Babylon. Verse 10. 
But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah the poor people, who had nothing, and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. You know, even in, God, even in judgment, God is just. And we see that right here. The rich who had oppressed the poor in Israel, that was part of the reason they were conquered. Because the rich had oppressed the poor. Well, they were either killed or they were taken into exile back to Babylon. Meanwhile, those who had suffered from their oppression, the poor, they are allowed to remain and even given land to farm by the king of Babylon. Verse 11, Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him and look after him, and do him no harm, but do to him just as he says to you. And 13 says, So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent Nebuchadban, Rabsaras, Nergel, Sharezer, Rabag and all the and all the king of Babylon's chief officers. And it says in verse 14, then they sent someone to take Jeremiah from the court of the prison and committed him to Gadaliah the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, that he should take him home, so he dwelt among the people. God punished the false prophets who said he would not punish. But God blessed the true prophet, Jeremiah, for speaking the hard truth, even though he suffered for doing it. 15. Now the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you. But I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you, because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. Ebed-Melech was a good man who believed God, and showed it by helping Jeremiah, who had proclaimed the word of God. And as a result, God will do good to Ebed-Melech. The Bible says that those who help a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Those who give to help get out the word of God will share in the preacher's reward. And we see that right here with Ebed-Melech. He put his life on the line to take care of God's man, Jeremiah. And now he is being blessed even as Jeremiah is being blessed. And we go into chapter 40, and it says in verse 1, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah, when he had taken him bound in chains among all who were carried away captive from Jerusalem and Judah, who were carried away captive to Babylon. Well, at first, after the Babylonian invasion, Jeremiah was in chains like all the other Israelite survivors and of course that's going to quickly change. The king of Babylon doesn't want Jeremiah to suffer. Verse 2, And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God has pronounced this doom on this place. Now the Lord has brought it and has done just as he said, because you people have sinned against the Lord and not obeyed his voice. Therefore this thing has come upon you Notice, this Babylonian was sharper, spiritually speaking, than most of the Israelites. He said, God punished you people for disobeying him. That's why we were able to conquer you. And he was right on target with that. Verse 4, And now look, I free you this day from the chains that were on your hand. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will look after you. But if it seems wrong for you to come with me to Babylon, remain here. See, all the land is before you. Wherever it seems good and convenient for you to go, go there. Jeremiah is given freedom to stay in Israel or to leave. Babylon promises to take care of him. Verse 5. Now, while Jeremiah 
had not yet gone back, Nebuzaradan said, Go back to Gadaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has made governor over the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people. Or go where, where he says, or go wherever it seems convenient for you to go. So the captain of the guard gave him rations and a gift and let him go. And so we see, again, in the midst of God's judgment, God was taking care of his faithful servant. Jeremiah was not removed from the place of judgment. He saw the city burned. He saw his country overcome by Babylon, and it was not pretty. It was very sorrowful for this man. But God, and he did not remove him from this, these judgments, but he did sustain him through it. And sometimes people you know, say that God will remove his people from the judgments that will occur in the last days. Well, so that they don't have to experience him. Well, that doesn't really have any biblical precedence. God often, you know, brings judgment on the world throughout the pages of Scripture, and his people must endure them. He preserves them through the judgments, but they still must endure them, and it's not fun. And that is what it will be like in the end of uh, this age as well. Verse 6, Then Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah, and dwelt with him among the people who were left in the land. Jeremiah decided to stay in Israel with the poor people who were allowed to stay as well. 7. Now when all the captains of the armies who were in the fields, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gadaliah the son of Ahiakim governor in the land, and had committed to him men, women, and children, and the poorest of the land, who had not been carried away captive to Babylon. Then they came to Gadaliah at Mizpah, Ishmael the son of Nathaniah, Johazan, Johazanan, and jo Jonathan the sons of Kariah, Sarahiah the son of Tanhumeth, and sons of Ephai, the Netophathite, and Jezaniah, the son of Maakathite, they and their men. And then it says in verse 9, And Gadaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, took, took an oath before them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. Gedaliah, the governor of Israel, encourages the surviving soldiers to be loyal to Babylon and everything will be okay. And he has God's word on this. It was God's will for Babylon to conquer and rule at this point. So they must submit to Babylon or they will find themselves fighting against God. Verse 10. As for me, I will indeed dwell in, at Mizpah and serve the Chaldeans who come to us. But you gather wine and summer fruit and oil, put them in your vessels, and dwell in your cities that you have taken. Jeremiah tells them to settle down and live a normal life. Verse 11, Likewise, when all the Jews who were in Moab, among the Ammonites in Edom, and who were in all the countries, heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah, and that he had set over them Gadaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan. Then all the Jews returned out of all the places where they had been driven, and came to the land of Judah, to Gadaliah, at Mizpah, and gathered wine and summer fruit in abundance. The Jews, who had run away during the invasion, returned to Israel when they heard that Babylon had established law and order in the land. 13. Moreover, Joanna, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields came to Gadaliah at Mizpah, and said to him, Do you certainly know that Baalis, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, to murder you? But Gadaliah, the son of Ahiakim, did not believe them, and that will be his downfall. He did not take seriously this warning. And so uh, the, uh, the soldiers warn the governor 
that the king of Ammon is plotting to kill him. But Gadaliah doesn't believe it. And then verse 15. Then Johanna, the son of Korea, spoke secretly to Gadaliah in Mizpah, saying, Let me go, please, and I will kill Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no one will know it. Why should he murder you, so that all the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? And he's saying, Look, this is going to happen. He's, he's out to kill you. He's a, he is a surrogate of the king of Ammon. And this Ishmael is going to kill you if he gets the chance. And don't just think about yourself. Think about all the people that you govern. I mean, they're just getting settled down here a little bit. Uh, you're going to cause all sorts of upheaval if you get yourself murdered. And that's what he's saying. Gadaliah, the governor, he is responsible for law and order. And things are just starting to settle down a little bit and become somewhat normal. And if the governor is murdered, everything will be chaotic once again. So his officer says, let me kill this king of Moab before he kills you. Let me kill his representative before he kills you. 16. But Gadaliah, the son of Ahiakim, said to Johanan, the son of Korea, You shall not do this thing, for you speak falsely concerning Ishmael. Oh, he, you know, he's as gullible as can be. Gadaliah didn't believe that anyone tried, would try to kill him, so he would not accept the help that he was offered. Until one knows that they are in danger, they will not turn to the Savior. Until one knows that they are in danger, they will not take refuge. Until one knows that they are in danger of hellfire because of their sin, they will not take refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior either. Okay, well, we'll stop right there for today, and we'll pick it up in chapter 41 next time. Until then, so long everyone.